Very good. All right, we don't have a lot of time, so that's, I'm glad that's working. Let's hope it stays that way. Before we get too far down the road, uh, hi. Oh, just garbage, trash, pure terrible, awful. Try again. Hello. Hello. There you go. I appreciate that. Good afternoon to you. I am so glad to be here before all of you today on this wonderful day. Uh, we have very little time, and so I'm going to get rid of, I'm going to dispense with business first. I need a photo, a selfie. All right, everybody say open source. Ready, steady. And then just pretend like you're happy. Just, just pretend. Okay, ready, steady. Open source. Open source. Ah, good stuff. Open source. Open source. Sweet nectar. That's awesome. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Now, we don't have a lot of time, and so as always, I encourage you to take note of this slide. This is the most important slide you're going to see in this room in this hour, uh, possibly ever, right? Uh, uh, this slide contains the code. It has the repository that you can follow along it, uh, with at your own leisure later on, your own discretion. And it's also got uh, my coordinates. So should you have questions, when you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer them. I'm on the Twitter, always curious about this. The number changes. How many of you are on Twitter? Twitter. All right, good stuff. The rest of you, you know, get on it. Oh, yeah. All right, good stuff. Um, so there's that. What about email? Anybody using email? Email. <laughs> I'm not really a big email fan, but you know, whatever. It's better than Slack. It's got to be better than Slack. I've got a friend, James Ward, who says that while he's not entirely sure, he thinks that based on CPU activity alone, that Slack is mining for Bitcoin, something I can believe. Something I can believe. I have a brand new MacBook Pro 2018 with 32 gigs of RAM, and the reason I bought it is so that I could run both Slack and Chrome <laughs> at the same time. Uh, I can't. But... You know, there's hope. Any hoodle, moving on. A little bit about me. My name is Josh Long. As was just explained, I work on the spring team. They made a toy out of me in China. That's kind of interesting. I have these online trainings that are on Safari. It's an all-you-can-eat technical marketplace for technical content. It's like Netflix, except you don't get stupider. Uh, there's that. Um, lots of stuff there. I have a book called Cloud Native Java, about which I'm very proud. The book is all about how to build applications that survive and thrive in the cloud. And it's really about microservices and continuous delivery and, and all that stuff, but it's done in terms of Cloud Foundry, Spring, Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, etc. And the whole point of this discussion is, you know, how do I get production? How do I get to production? And uh, you're going to see that when we talk about testing, we do so because we care about production. We care about agility. Uh, this book is something I like. It's something I worked on long and hard with my, my uh, co-author, Kenny Bastani. And the book is available in at least four different languages. I'm hoping to get, avail get it available in English, like English English with all the extra U's and stuff. So that'll be, that'll be nice. Um, that's a joke, friends. <laughs> it's a joke. Any hoodle, move on. Uh, I have a podcast every Friday. That's, uh, that's, I, just I just uploaded today's, or sorry, tomorrow's installment. That's called A Beautiful Podcast, where I talk to people in the ecosystem about this, that, and the rest. It's, it's, it, the focus is the people, and uh, subordinate to that is the technology, but the people are often as not uh, working on technology, so it you know, happens that we talk about technology a lot. And I think that's kind of an interesting place to be, is just to Talk to, people, talk to the people that are doing the real work. Me, I'm kind of a clown. I'm up here uh, with my ASCII art jokes, but these are the people that make the ecosystem amazing. And so it's a privilege to talk to them. I have a video series, a video screencast thing I do every Wednesday, and there's just one, there was one that just went up, uh, what day is today? Yesterday, Wednesday. One that went up yesterday called um, Reactive Web Views, and you know, every Wednesday, a screencast focusing on some corner of the ecosystem, 30, 40 minutes, whatever. And I've got a new book called Reactive Spring, which is all about how to build applications that, uh, uh, that take advantage of reactive programming. And that's available for pre-order now. So you, you can buy it on LeanPub now, go to that link. And uh, if you buy the discounted price now, you get the early content. And then when it's final and finished, you get, the, you get the full book for the same price as you bought it today. You don't have to buy it again. It's just you're entitled to the final copy. So that's all well and good. And all of that is sort of ambient to what we're going to talk about today, which is testing. Right? We want to do testing. We want to focus on how to test the, uh, the, how to have confidence in the code that we deliver to production. And this is very much, I think, a thing that people move to now more and more as we start thinking about continuous delivery, as we start thinking about how do I take an idea from concept to customer to move it from an idea all the way to production, right? How do I move that code down that pipeline from product management, user experience, developers, testers, you know, administrators, and then off into production? Obviously, the goal here is to go as quickly as possible so that you can get feedback and incorporate that feedback in your changes to see that feedback benefit your next iteration. The problem with this goal is that if you don't have a confidence in what you're doing, then you're just asking for catastrophe, aren't you? Anybody can get in a Ferrari and go real fast into a wall. 
That's not interesting, right? What we want to do is to go fast and have confidence in what we're doing and to have the ability to be confident that the changes we've made haven't introduced a regression. And so the way to do that, of course, naturally, is testing. Uh, and the thing that people struggle with is, okay, I get, I get unit testing, right? We, we can understand that. I, can get, I get uh, integration testing. I get you know, end-to-end -end testing, smoke testing, etc. But at some point, you get into this world where you have massive amounts of distributed systems, these distributed services talking to each other over the network. And there you get into trouble. And so what we're going to talk about, my friends, is sort of what that, look, what that continuum looks like. We're going to focus on small, singly focused, sort of fast feedback unit tests, and we're going to move progressively up the stack until we get to that last place where we're de deploying whole systems, and we want feedback on that. We want confidence in that. We also want to keep in mind that we're trying to, do, we're trying to keep the, uh, the, the, the test pyramid in mind, right? We want 80%-ish fast feedback tests. And then the top of the pyramid, the, the balance of that pyramid should be slower, but progressively more exhaustive uh, sort of integration test and end-to-end and, uh, -end tests and so on. The goal here is to keep most of, your, the, most of the bulk of your tests in a, in a way that you can get fast feedback on every single small change. That way, even if you catch 80% of the bugs and you only catch the other 20% you know, with those sort of end-to-end -end tests that you run inside of a CI environment, if you catch 80%, you can move with confidence, right? And you'll occasionally get a hiccup that requires you to go back and sort of figure out what you did. But hopefully the gap between introducing a bug and finding the bug is small because you have a constant feedback loop. That's the goal here, right? And this gets to, the point, this gets to another point about testing. How should you do testing? Right? We want that fast feedback loop. When do we want the feedback? Do we want the feedback after you've written the code? Long after it, right? Or do you want it as you're developing it? And for me, I'm all about getting it up front, as, fa as, as, as upfront as possible. I want to I wanna write the code first, uh, write the test code first, and then write the production code first, right? I, I want to get the feedback as upfront as possible, not because I'm particularly disciplined, mind you, but because I have a brain, right? So keep in mind, Think about this. There's a there's a there's a, uh, a a a discussion to be had about the benefits of testing as a way of of uh, making life more pleasurable. Okay, so think about this. When we, as human beings, play video games. Anybody here play video games? Video games? Yeah. Okay. Or jog. Who who jogs? Sort of the opposite end of the spectrum of that <laughs> that particular discussion. But okay, jogs, right? Or uh, or sports of some sort. It doesn't have to be jogging. Whatever, right? All of us. Those of us who are interested in those things find ways to get very interested in those things. And the reason is because they offer us ample opportunity for perceived imminent horizons. That is to say, a goal that we can get to pretty quickly. We can see it. It's right there. We just have to keep going. If I just run a little faster or play this game a little longer, I'll get there. And the next thing you know, you, know, you sit down at 9 a.m. and the next thing you know, it's ne tomorrow. You know? <laughs> like, we've all been there where we've, where we've had something over which we've obsessed. Right? Same thing with, uh, with code. If you've done coding long enough, you'll have that experience where you sit down and the next thing you know, it's tomorrow, right? You get carried away because it's so satisfying. You feel like you're in the zone, we say, right? Being in the zone is that sense of getting feedback that, oh, good, I'm making progress. Let's keep going, right? I can see how this is going to unfold if I just keep pushing it. So this, this fast feedback mechanism is, is useful because it makes it so that you're always in the zone. You don't feel like you're tripping up. And the reason is because you write your tests first and then you get the fast feedback saying, hey, you're, you're doing good, keep going, it's green. But think about if you did it the other way around. Think about if you did the production code first, and then later on, oh, I better write the tests and some documentation. What a chore. What a buzzkill, right? Nobody wants to do that. So you write the test first so that you have the ceiling of, hey, I did it. I'm at the, it's green, and the production software is working. I've delivered the feature, and I've written the test. They, they both happen at the same time. So you're optimizing for a constant, like, dopamine hit. That's the goal here. You write tests first so that you're never, ever bummed out about having to do the right thing. Also, when you write tests first, you have to write software that is, by definition, testable. That is to say, you've, you've carved out and extracted the seams of the, compo of the components in the, in the application. You can't test things in isolation if they can't be isolated, by, you know, put another way. So the goal here is to write tests first and to see how that helps us write software uh, write better software and get it into production faster. So, as always, my friends, as always, we're going to do that today. We're going to explore the wide world of testing in the Spring ecosystem by going to my second favorite place on the internet after production. I love production. You should love production. You should go as early and often as possible. Bring the kids, bring the family. The weather is amazing. It's the happiest place on earth. It's better than Euro Disney. But if you haven't been there, of course, you begin your journey here at start. 
that spring trayo if you need inspiration in the early morning before a cup of tea or coffee start that spring trayo if your children are restless and can't sleep start that spring trayo and if you suffer from indigestion after a long night of alcohol abuse and php <laughs> start that spring that i o so we're going to build a new piece of software today we're going to call this the producer i'm going to use 2.20m2 for spring boot i'm going to bring in the reactive web support i'm going to bring in lumbuck i'm going to bring in the reactive mongodb support uh, and i'm going to use the uh, the verifier the spring cloud contract verifier and we're going to get to that in just a moment and now with that done I'm going to go to my downloads directory here. All right? And open this up, make that a little larger. Good stuff. Okay? Now we're going to talking about testing, but I'm going to test reactive code. What you need to understand is that, that there are types that will produce data asynchronously. They'll publish data asynchronously. And so testing becomes a bit more involved in that case, doesn't it? Now a lot of what we're going to talk about translates naturally to the old synchronous and blocking world, but keep in mind I'm going to be doing it in this asynchronous non-blocking world just to throw an extra wrench in the uh, in the equation, okay? All right. Uh so, here's my production code uh and I'm going to move very promptly past that to the test code. In IntelliJ you can say command shift T and it'll automatically take you to the test that suffixes with test uh if you have the same base type okay now this test is included in spring boot it's a when you go to the spring initializer it generates a a pre-written test for you um i'm going to use java 11 because 2019 okay or java 12 even but this is at least lts um and you can see that when you use spring boot you get test support out of the box there's reactor test there's a spring boot starter test framework and so you get a lot just by using that I like this pre-generated test. It's kind of like a tombstone or a, a, like a token test. It's a reminder that you should be writing tests. But if I'm honest, this is not a great test. Okay? So I'm going to delete it and we're going to start a testing discussion in terms of the basic entity. I'm going to start testing inside out. I'm going to go from the smallest thing all the way to the biggest, coarsest thing, okay? That's the one way to do it. The other way is to go outside in, where you start from the coarse grained user interface or REST API or whatever and then go into the components. There's discussions about uh, to be had about which way is better. I like inside out because it allows lots of teams to work in concurrence, right? They're in, they're they're focusing on very small things. So one team can work on something else and the other team can work on something else. And yes, you defer some of the risk, the integration, that is, uh until the end, but that's okay because that's that's actually less of the code, right? Most of the code is in the small stuff. So it's a you know, you could do it the other way around. You could say the risky part is the integration and you should get that sorted out first. You should work on the uh the big stuff first right out, out uh, outside in but in my case i think it works and plus it allows me to naturally you know scale out what we look at right so reservation pojo i'm just going to create an object called a reservation it's going to be a thing that i'm going to write to the database but we're not going to even gonna, let's not even talk about the database let's just talk about an object okay so create all right so i'm going to create an object called a reservation and when i create this new reservation i want to be able to give it fields reservation uh like this and you can see i've already got a test error so i you know i'm i've already got a problem don't i i've got red code here and so you have to as you introduce errors or as you introduce things that break the test you go back and add the production code to satisfy the test all right green and you can see i've got a constructor it's not happy so i'm going to add this now i can see that i'm going to have two fields one is going to be a string for an id and the other one for the name and uh, i could write getters and setters right i could do this i could say you know that and this and equals and hash code oh so modern right i could do all that and just throw it away and leave right um or or uh use lumbuck right lumbuck at org constructor norx constructor and then just remove all that garbage good stuff okay so there's my basic entity and i want to i want to just test that when i use when i create this object and it has state that i can assert things about that state so i'm going to say assert dot true or equals e even uh reservation dot get id equals 1 okay very simple test um i could use assertions or sorry i can use the hamcrest matcher library so i can actually use a an overloaded version from uh from the junit api that takes something called a matcher and the way that works is you say oh get reservation name and then you pass in a matcher you can see that type there you could create your own matcher but don't and and if you're not if you're not convinced of that you'll see this ridiculous uh don't implement matcher right <laughs> in the API. So I think they're trying to communicate, right? I think that's a way of saying don't do this. All right? So we're going to create a new 
base matcher. You could, you could create your own base matcher, and that actually would work. That's fine. But a lot of times you don't need to because Hamcrest has a lot of good stuff there. I can say matcher is not null value, and that'll work. Another way to do it is to use assert J, and that's actually pre prepackaged on the, on the class path as well. So I can say uh, assert that reservation uh, dot get ID, right? And I'm going to say is not null or not empty, right? So I'm actually getting this nice sort of uh, fluid auto-completing way of testing, okay? So let's just run this and see what we get. You get all that for free when you use Spring Boot. All that stuff is just pre-provided for you on the class path so you can focus on the business of testing code, not coffee, all right? So there's that. Now, um, I am going to eventually want to talk to a database. So the natural next step is to create a reservation entity test, right? I want to prove that when I decorate my object correctly, that Spring Data MongoDB can persist it. I want to see that it can be round-tripped from my code down to the database and then back again. And this means that I have to map the fields in the object to the right things in the database. So in MongoDB parlance, a, a, a collection is a, like a table. It's got a whole bunch of rows, and each row is called a document, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to convert my little Java object into a document-compatible, mappable thing. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a test that proves that I can persist this data. Okay? And in order to persist the data I'm in my code, I'm going to use the reactive Mongo template. So uh, there's that. And I'm I guess I'm going to just say dot .save. And it's going to take a new object of type reservation, maybe. And so I'm going to pass a null for the ID, because that's what it, that should be up to the database. Um, and then I get a publisher back. I get a reactive publisher. It's a mono, but that's a specialization of this thing called a, uh, of a publisher. Now, you can think of a mono as kind of like a completable future that supports back pressure or client-managed flow control. All right. For now, it's not all that important. Hopefully, you'll dig into that in another, another time. But for, the point is, this doesn't represent an actual value. This is an IOU. I can redeem it by waiting for it. I can subscribe to the publisher and get the data later. And that makes testing a bit involved, as you can imagine. So Spring provides a very nice API called Step Verifier. Uh, and you can say, hey, given a publisher, let's prove something about the state of the, of the data that comes back. Let's force it to resolve the value, and then let's get the value and look at it and poke at it. And so I want to say, oh, well, reservation.getName should equal, let's say Jane, and reservation.getID should not equal null, right? We're expecting that by the time it's been persisted and it comes back in the persisted state, it should have round-tripped and been given an ID, OK? So there's my, my little test there. And finally, when I'm done with that series of assertions, I can do a lot of different other things here. I call verify next. Now, how am I going to write this data to the database? I'm using MongoDB. I've got Spring Boot. Spring Boot's going to auto-configure a connection factory. That connection factory is going to talk to the database for me. But in my test here, this test knows nothing about Spring. And so I need to use a runner, right? So I can use run with spring runner dot class. Now, the problem is that, you know, that isn't enough. I don't, it doesn't know about Spring Boot. Now, I could teach it about Spring Boot. I could say, hey, create a whole Spring Boot application context using the Spring Boot test annotation. But I don't want all of Spring Boot, right? All I want is the, is the data persistent stuff the stuff having to do with persisting MongoDB, because that's the thing under test. And so I'll use what's called a test slice. A test slice in Spring Boot is a thing that resets all the auto configuration and then only selectively brings back certain parts. So there's all sorts of different slices for the web tier, for, for security, for MongoDB, for JDBC, for JPA, for all these different things, right? Common slices of your application context. And so here, it's going to create a uh, MongoDB test context. You could go a step further to help out in that process if you wanted to. You could use something called Flapdoodle. Flapdoodle uh, is an um, embedded uh, MongoDB database. And when Spring Boot perceives that on the class path, it creates an embedded MongoDB, which is nice. I don't particularly want it right now. It doesn't matter. But it's nice to know that you've got that option. All right. So when I use, embedded Mon when I use MongoDB, it's going to create a reactive Mongo template that I can then use to write data to the database. Uh, I'm actually using Spring Boot, but I'm only using the parts that I care about. Let's run this test and see what we get. OK. One can hope. Oh, look, I got water. So nice. All right. Good stuff. So there's our, our test that came back. Good. Now I want to prove that when I create a repository that I write data to the database, and I can pull it back out again using a re repository query. OK, so I'm going to create a query in this repository. Now, repository is, an, is a pattern from domain-driven design by Eric Evans. It's a, oh, yeah. 
All right. It's a pattern that is meant to. Uh, it's a pattern that's meant to uh, insulate the lower-level business logic from the tedious, soul annihilatingly boring data management lifecycle at the higher levels. The read, write, update, delete, create, etc. Crud. Right. So I'm going to create a test, same as before. Public void uh, query, and. I don't have a query yet. I haven't defined the repository yet, for that matter. But we know it's going to be a data Mongo test. We know that we have to use the Spring Runner uh, here. And I'm going to now inject my repository, which I haven't defined. And you can, I, can, I think you can see where this is, going to, this is going to lead me, right? It's not going to work. I don't have this type. I can't inject it. This isn't Ruby. Uh, so I'm going to create that type, that interface here. Now, in Spring Data, we have this basic mechanism, this Spring Data mechanism, where you can create an interface, and then it'll extend another interface, and those interfaces define methods that support saving, updating, deleting, uh, et cetera, streams of data. That's very useful uh, because it solves a lot of the sort of pain of, of, uh, of data management. But we can also create custom finder methods, OK? And that's what we want to test here. So let's do that here. I've, got a, I've injected the repository. I've got a test. Let's write some data to the database. So I'll say, uh, let's create, let's, we're going to create a reactive publisher with some names, OK? So A, B, C. C, and then I'll map the name into a new reservation, passing in the name, and I'm going to save each one of those into the database by using the repository like that, and that gives me a stream of data, right? So I want to I want to leave it like that. That's fine. Well, what am I doing wrong? Come on, computer. Do 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 the whole thing. Good stuff. Okay. And what I want to do is I want to also save everything. But before I do that, I want to delete everything in the database. So I'm going to reset my state, basically. And this is where having Flapdoodle separate and apart from your production database might be very useful. I'm going to say repeat uh, repository.delete all. And then once you've deleted everything asynchronously, I want you to write the data to the database like this. And then once that's done, uh, let's query it using our new query, find by name. We don't have a query like that. So I'm going to create it here. And you can see it's going to create a, it's going to automatically create a, a, a query for me, a MongoDB BSON predicate based on the name of the method. So it's going to say, find all the reservations that have the name attribute equal to name as I've passed it into this method. And once that's done, well, that's the thing I want to poke at. That's the thing I want to assert certain things about, right? That's the resulting uh, uh, results uh, that come back from the database. And that's the thing I'm going to pass to my step verifier. I'm going to say, OK, uh, create this results. And then assert things about the count. Ex expect next count is equal to 2. We, we know that I've deleted everything, and I've created two records of type 2. So that should be as expected. All right, so let's run this. Let's see what we get there. Oh, good stuff. Here we go. All right. So that works. Every now and then, it is helpful, I think, to, um, to break your tests, just to prove that your tests are working. Right? If, you, if your tests passed all the time, then you should be worried. I would be worried. At least I would. Right? Either your tests are broken or your code is. They can't always be both working all the time. So every now and then it helps to break it just to introduce a, uh, oh, that's not going to break it. Here, um, CC. That, that'll change this. Run that again. So that should give me one result back. And so it should break my query, which should prove that the test is broken. OK, good. So we know the test is working, because when it was green, it was working. So good, 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 good. Now we've got data. We've got data access. Now I want to talk about the web tier. And so I'm going to create a reservation HTTP test. And here, I'm going to write data to the database. OK? Uh, sorry, I'm going to write data using the web tier. I'm going to read data from the web tier. And so I'm going to create another endpoint, another test that reads using um, you know, the HTTP API. In order to do that test, I'm going to use the web test client, the reactive web test client. This is a mock client. Uh, that'll actually talk to my API, and it'll exercise everything having to do with the HTTP tier. Uh, so I'm going to use a different slice here, WebFlux test. There's an equivalent for WebMVC as well, which gives you a mock MVC object. And this, I'm going to say git dot uri forward slash reservations, and I'm going to expect that the results come back and have a status of 200, and I'm going to expect that the uh, header comes back, headers come back, and the content type is compatible with application JSON. And I'm going to expect that the body comes back and matches a JSON path expression. Now, anybody here remember XPath? XPath is a way of querying an XML document, right? You could index into a certain fields. We have the same thing for JSON here. So I'm going to say that the first element that comes back from the JSON array 
uh, in this result, in this request, the first one that comes back, the zeroth element that comes back, should have a name equal to Jane. Well, hold on a tick, I can hear you say. I don't remember you introducing Jane. Who's Jane? And for that matter, who's John? Get, stop it. What are you doing? You're going way too fast, Josh. You're just assuming that we're all on the same page. I understand your, con your confusion. Let's say that I ran this code, uh, and we did, actually we did actually have an HTTP endpoint. Right? Let's say that we did have that. We don't, by the way. We should build that. What do you think that's going to look like? So let's go back to our producer code. Reservation. HTTP configuration. And I'm just going to register a HTTP endpoint in my application in the production code. And it'll just be a simple bean. I'm going to use the new functional reactive HTTP endpoint style in Spring Framework 5. Uh, and I'm just going to register it like this. So route. OK, routes. And I'll say return route build, good stuff. And I'm going to say uh, that when somebody makes a, a, a REST call, an HTTP call to HTTP forward slash, you know, localhost 8084 slash reservations, I want this handler function to be invoked and be put in, pr in, in charge of producing a response. And in order to do that, I'll inject the reservation repository, the bean that we know we have, and I'll just uh, call find all like that. Now, of course, you can see the opportunity here. IntelliJ is letting or graying the way, rather. I can remove the uh, boilerplate there, use on-demand statics, and there's my uh, much more concise functional reactive endpoint. So let's say we understand how that's working. It's a bean that defines an HTTP endpoint. In order to do that, I inject a reference to the collaborating object. Surely that will work, right? Uh, let's say we have to figure out how the names get there, but surely that should work. What do we get if we run this code? What do you think is going to happen? Let's see. Run git. Awkward. We didn't get very far, I can tell, because it, yeah, I didn't even get my first gulp of coffee down. This thing, uh, first of all, 404 not found, fair enough, so I need to involve that class, all right? Uh, and in order to do that, I'm going to use uh, this annotation attribute here. I'll say like that, okay, restart, good. Still broken and, and quick to boot. So what happened? Well, it says that this configuration requires a bean of type reservation repository, right? This is Spring. Why didn't Spring know about my, my HTTP configuration? And now, once it knows about that, why does it know about the repository? And the reason is because this is a test slice. Like I said, this carves up your application context. It only includes certain beans that match a certain criteria. In this case, it's only including web tier components. So all the stuff to do with the database, the MongoDB repository, the connection factory, all that stuff, it's as though you never defined it, right? And that's okay. I don't want to test MongoDB. We just did that. We've been there, got the t-shirt, we're fine. Right? We know that works. What we want to prove is that when I poke at my HTTP API, I get a response that matches the shape of something I'm expecting. I don't need MongoDB for that. So what would you normally do if you've got a part of the test that's invariant, in this case the data tier, and you've got part of the test that's under test, that's in this case the HTTP tier, what would you normally do in that case? Mock. Yeah. You'd mock it out. So I could do this very naturally in Spring Boot by using at mock bean. And this uses Mockito behind the scenes, but it actually creates a mock that gets in added to the application context. It's not just at mock, which is from Mockito, it's at mock bean, which is a Spring Boot annotation, and it does mostly the same thing as at mock, except that it replaces any bean in the application context of the same type as the field that's been annotated with the mock, or it adds a bean of the type annot you know, annotated in the field there uh, to the application context with the mock. Right? So if you didn't have a bean of this type before, you do now, it's a mock. If you did, you've replaced it, it's now a mock. Okay? So now every, all, the other, all the rest of the code, including our HTTP endpoint, this is going to inject the mock. Okay? It's like you defined a configuration class and provided the bean, etc. And so now, in my test, I need to configure what happens, because I don't actually need a mock, do I? A mock is just a, an empty object that returns null and zero and false and all this. It's, it, it holds the shape you know, of something that's expected there, but it's a non-null value, but it's not really what I want. I want to pre-program it to respond in a certain way. So I need a stub. So I'm going to use Makito's handy API here. I'll say when this dot repository dot find all, then return. And I'm going to create a new publisher, a new publisher one, Jane, and another reservation here to John. All right. So now let's see what we get. Keep going faster. Anything would be good. All right. 
Hopefully that'll work, fingers and eyes crossed. Mm -hmm. Not bad, huh? So now we've got confidence that the service producer side is working. Let's build a client. I'm going to go back to here. I'll just call this the consumer. Okay. And we're going to keep the reactive web support. We're going to get rid of Mongo. We're going to get rid of the verifier. And we are going to use the stub runner. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. And I'm going to open up this new client, in, this new consumer, in my IDE as before. And what we're doing is we've got a producer side API, don't we? we it's all working. We know that it, top to bottom, that's working just fine. On the consumer side, I want to build a, a Java API that other people can use to talk to my API. And so I'll go here to my tests, of course. And uh, maybe I'll just get rid of, actually, it's fine. This one's fine. I can, I can keep it. So I'm going to inject the reservation client. OK, there's that. And uh-oh, uh that doesn't exist. Let's create it. The client will be a thing that returns a publisher of reservations from the service. OK? And in order to return those reservations, I need to define the type. Right, so I'll create the type here, private string ID, private string reservation name. OK, good stuff. All right, now, uh, that's going to use Lumbuck, of course, so at data, at all args constructor, at no args constructor. And um, now, I need to make the call. I'm going to actually have a spring bean that makes that call to the, over the network. In order to make that network call, I'll use the reactive web client. The web client is an HTTP client that uses non-blocking I.O. on the client side. It has nothing to do with the server side. It, you know, your server side could be blocking or non-blocking, etc. And I'm going to make a call to reservations. This is the, the path of the base URL, which we haven't specified yet, but we'll do that. Um, and I'm going to say that the results come back, and they should be mapped from the JSON into reservations. All right. Now, this is our spring bean. I got a little ahead of myself here. Let's go to our test. And I'm going to say, all right, uh, a step verifier dot create this dot client dot get all reservations, and I want to expect uh, certain things about it. I want to say, okay, um, predicate reservation p sure string id string name. Okay. Now I'm going to return a new predicate object that tests that the reservations id is equal to ignore case whatever id is, and the reservation get reservation name is equal to whatever name is, all right? And there's some other things I could and probably should be doing there, but let's just leave it there. OK, so there's my little predicate. And I'm going to say, OK, expect next matches, p, 1, Jane, and John, 2, all right? Verify complete. So there's my little test. Now, um, a couple things. Obviously, this is in a spring bean, so I need to make that work. Uh, I'm going to need to define the web client somewhere. No, p no better place than configuration, so I'll do that here. I'll inject the client. And in order to build the client, I'll use the web client builder, like so. And I'll say return builder.build. And of course, I need to specify a base URL. So I'm going to say base URL equals HTTP localhost 8080. Now, you could probably use a service registry, something like Eureka or Zookeeper or Console or etcd or Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes or whatever. And Spring Cloud provides the discovery client abstraction. But for now, Let's just move on. OK, um, thanks for that. Now, what do, we, what do we get if we run this code? Do you think it's going to work? I think not. I think uh, if you've learned anything from me uh, about how to avoid mistakes when you write code, it's that I make a lot of mistakes when I write code. So uh, let's see what we get. Ha ha. See that? Connection refused. Here we get into a bit of a problem. We've gotten so far so quick, and yet now, we face, now we're faced with what I consider to be a serious impediment, a serious roadblock. We have an API that exists on the network that we want to make a connection to, uh, but we, we need to run that service in order to do that, don't we? This gets to a, a, a sort of a cultural issue, I think. You see, I don't know how it is here. I don't want to presume to know what is uh, true here, right? Things are different in every part of the world. But um, in the States where I come from, even in Silicon Valley, which is kind of a tire fire, even in Silicon Valley where I come from, this, th there are some things that you can do that are considered very friendly when you have a new person come into the office, a new employee that's starting. Hi, welcome, come in, have a seat. You know, that's a very friendly thing to say. It's considered vulgar, very rude, on the other hand, to say, hi, welcome, have a seat. Now please deploy this Kubernetes cluster to start doing anything. Right? It's very offensive. Nobody wants to be told that. Nothing says, I don't value you as a person more than that. 
If I have to deploy a Kubernetes cluster just to test my JavaScript app, things are broken. They're broken. You need to stop, go get another job, do something else. So I don't want to have to be told I have to deploy every single service in my system just to test this client. That's a bad posture. It's a bad starting posture. What I want to do is mock out that API, right? Because otherwise, if I had to start and deploy everything, well, first of all, I can just barely run Slack. What makes you think I'm going to be able to run a whole production cluster on my local machine? And if I have to timeshare with other people in, the, in an integration environment, well, that's going to be slow, isn't it? Right? I don't want to do any of that. I'd much rather just be able to th test things in isolation. So one thing I could do on this client is use wiremock. So I say at auto configure wiremock port equals 8080. And here, I'm going to set up a fake API. I'm going to say wiremock dot stub for wiremock dot uh, get wiremock uh, URL equal to reservations. And, uh, oop, wrong one. We'll return wiremock, this is not our API, a response dot with a body, and we're going to talk about that body in a second, uh, and with a header, so HTTP headers dot, uh, which one? You think somebody else would have thought of this? Okay, good. Content type, media type is going to be equal to application JSON value, okay, and then with status, HTTP status dot okay dot value, good stuff, look at that. So there's my body, and I need the string body, I need that body in order for this to work. So one way to do this is to use JSON. I can just save myself some pain, auto configure JSON, auto configure JSON, okay, and I'm going to inject an uh, object mapper here. All right, and this object mapper I can use to write some data. So I'm going to create a uh, uh, arrays dot as list new reservation uh, one Jane new reservation to John. All right, and there's my my collection of reservations. I'm going to turn that into a string. So I'll say this dot object mapper dot write value as a string reservations. And that'll give me a string back. Throw exception, please. Okay. So there's my JSON, and I can just use that as the body. I'll just pass that into the string here. Good stuff. You think that'll work? I think it will. So that's going to start up Wiremock. Wiremock's going to use this definition. It's going to create a fake you know, API that has pre-programmed responses. In effect, I'm, I'm stubbing out the, the network itself, right? And uh, I'm using this interesting API to do that. Let's start it up. Let's go. Okay. All right, that looks like it worked, right? Everything's happy. You can see that when somebody connected to port uh, 8080 and localhost, uh, that they got this JSON stream that matches the expectations of the client. Everything's great. We should be able to go to production now. It'll be all just fine, right? Well, of course not. There, this is where things get, this is where the fly in the ointment comes, and this is what I meant when I talked about how integration is where the most risk is. Because two different autonomous teams have been evolving this API and this code independent of each other, and thus far, everything is green on both sides. Now comes integration, and what do we discover? Well, somebody, and I'm not going to say who, it well, might have been me, might have been somebody else, somebody fat-fingered the attribute here. There's no re reservation name on the producer side. It's just called name. Right? So if you look at this reservation repository, look at the reservation, there's never going to be a reservation name. So that would never work. Everything's green on both sides, and yet it's not going to work. It's going to blow up catastrophically. And that's kind of an insidious position to be in, isn't it? Right? To feel like you've gotten that close to production, but yet it's going to break. So you need to write those exhaustive end-to-end -end tests. But again, you've lost some velocity when you do that. If you actually have to deploy a whole Kubernetes cluster on every single CI build, you're going to defer the opportunity for integration. Not to mention it's tedious. So what I want is some way to get fast feedback without having to deploy the cluster. And one way to do this is to use consumer-driven contracts and consumer-driven contract testing. The way this works is you define a thing that will be turned into an API. It's transpiled into a test, rather, not an API. It's transpiled into a test, and that test exercises your producer API in exactly the same way as we just did here with the reservation HTTP test. Here, it uses the web test client. It calls certain endpoints. It, expect, it pokes at the response. It comes back. It asserts certain things about the results. I want to do the same thing, but I want to have that test automatically do that for me. I want to have this contract do that for me, right? I want to use the contract to assert the exact same things about my API. And the benefit of that is that once I have the contract, 
And once I've used that to validate the API, the producer side, I can then use the contract to stand up a Wiremark API on the client. Right? And I won't, the reason that this is valid is because now both sides are sharing the same artifact. But they're not sharing the artifact at production time. They're sharing it at test time. So it's not overhead. I don't have to add a bunch of annotations to my production code. I don't have to try and second guess the meta model that each framework uses to describe these endpoints. I am testing. I'm certifying what I am testing. Okay? So we're going to do that using something called Spring Cloud Contract. Now, the first step here is to create a contract definition. You can do that source test resources contracts. It's a directory in the test folder there. I'm going to use, I'm going to reimport the Maven build so that I can uh, have that as a, like a managed resource directory. Okay, good. I'm going to create a simple file. Should return all reservations.groovy. All right. And this is going to be a Groovy DSL. There's one in Kotlin coming up. You can do it in uh, YAML as well. And there's also a way to use PACT, P-A-C-T, which is a, another similar kind of thing that works slightly differently, but they provide PACT definitions as well. And so these contracts assert both what you expect the API should produce and what a response, uh, or sorry, what they, it asserts, it, 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 it stipulates what you think a request to the API should look like and what the response coming back should look like. So description should return all reservations, request, request a request to one endpoint. And by the way, I've got one contract here. You have one contract for every use case. Every case that you expect a client to be able to depend on, you define a, a contract. So you could have thousands of these. And these are great ways of making sure that if you introduce a breaking change, that you've managed to simultaneously keep the old API and the new one working for old clients, right? If you have, the, if you have a question about versioning, you should also be talking about contracts, okay? So the URL will be two forward slash reservations. The method that we're expecting to work with is httpmethods.get. Uh, and then the response is going to look like this. It's going to have a body, and we're going to talk about the body in a second here. It's going to have a status of HTTP status dot 200, right? Dot OK dot 200. It's going to be, um, a, it's going to have some headers, and those headers will have a content type, and the content type will be application JSON, okay? So that's what we're expecting. Now the body, I could provide a string. I could actually just provide a string literal. This is Groovy after all. But instead, I'm going to use this nice feature in Groovy to do object literals. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, uh, when, when, uh, you know, when I'm given an object, I'm going to create a, basically a, a, a list of maps, right? And this gets turned into JSON behind the scenes. So ID will be one, name will be uh, Jane, ID will be two, name will be John, okay? So that looks like it's kind of JSON-esque, but it's not JSON. But it'll be turned into JSON behind the scenes. Okay. Now this contract is only as useful as its enforcement. No contract in a court of law and a system of law is useful if there's no measure of enforcement, no mechanism for recourse. And so we need to have that. What we're going to do is we're going to introduce a plugin into our build that breaks the build if the contract doesn't line up with our expectations about the actual API, if it doesn't line up with the actual API itself. So I'm going to add this dependency, this build plugin here by copying and pasting. Don't do that at home. Okay. And uh, we go to our build plugin section here. There we are. Plugin, org Spring Framework Cloud, Spring Cloud Contract Maven plugin. I'm giving it a version, and I'm specifying a base class. So remember, this is going to get transpiled into a new class, a new thing. That new class has uh, uh, these assertions, but just as before, with my HTTP test, I have to set up some, some I have to have a, a, a mock bean, didn't I? Same thing is going to apply here. I'm going to create a web test, but it's going to depend on the repository. This new auto-generated thing doesn't know about my repository. It doesn't know about the mock uh, or stubbed repository that I created. So we need to have the same thing. So we're going to put that logic, that customization, here in a base class, which will live in our producer test folder. It's not a test in of itself. It's a thing that our auto-generated contract-based tests will extend. And you can do all sorts of mappings from, you know, if, if, your test, if your contract is named this or in this package, it should map to that base class or whatever. But for now, I'm just going to use the same base class for everything, since there's only one contract, OK? So, this is a Spring Boot test. It's going to have, I'm going to run it on a random port, okay, web environment equals random port. Uh, it's going to use a, uh, the configuration, so producer application dot class, like so. Uh, it's going to run with spring runner dot class. Uh, I'm going to create a before method that sets up the uh, repository here, and I'm going to use mock bean. Reservation repository, repository, and I'm going to say 
Um, same as I did before with the HTTP test, I'll say, go here, get that, paste, okay? And I also need to configure something called rest assured. Now rest assured is the mechanism behind the scenes that we're using to allow us to, to do all this work. So I'm just gonna use rest assured behind the scenes. Uh, and that's basically everything I need in my base test. So let's see if that works. Let's see if that actually does what we expect now. So if I go to producer, maven, install, maven clean install even, let's see what we get. Fingers and eyes crossed. Come on. Just want to get it right. Maybe? Nope. Okay, so what did we do wrong? What did I do wrong? Here I am trying to blame you. Silly. Connection, contract verifier test should return all reservations. Netty started on port 617. <laughs> oh, right. This doesn't, I told it to use a random port, and I didn't give it a random port. It needs to know what port to use, so I'm going to use local server port private int port. I'm telling it to inject the port, and then that's the URL we're going to point it to. So <clears throat> we can try this again. Not you. Nobody wants you to run. Go away. Okay. So now we've rerun the build on the, on the producer side. Fingers and eyes crossed. Is that okay? There we go. Good stuff. So if you look at this, you can see the normal suspects, the usual suspects got installed. There's a pom.xml and there's our jar. But most saliently, we have a stubs.jar. And this contains the wiremock DSL, basically. It contains the definition that a wiremock will need to create a fake endpoint that matches the contract. And that's been insert, installed into our Maven repository locally. We could use Nexus or Artifactory or whatever the uh, Nexus, you know, Maven Artifact repository du jour is. You could use that. And that's a great way for you to communicate artifacts with other parts of the organization. That doesn't get installed until the tests are green, right? We saw that it, we saw that it created the test for us, and I can actually see find iname contract verifier test dot java. And if I look at that, cat that file, you can see it's a pre-written, it's a code-generated test for us. It does what we basically think it's going to do. It's going to say, OK, make that request, expect status code 200, expect the application JSON, expect the body has ID equal to 1 and name equal to Jane, and two, ID equals 2 and name is equal to John. Right? It's doing that for us. It's generating from that contract. But that contract itself is interesting as well. We've communicated that by deploying it to our local repository. Here, I just did Maven clean install. I'm a local machine. But once you've gotten that working, you publish it to your organization's Artifactory or, or Nexus or whatever. And now, on the consumer side, somebody else building this client can use that instead of having this, this fake wire mock test that doesn't actually prove anything. We haven't proved that things are going to work as we expect. So I'm going to comment that wire mock, and I'll bring in the stub runner. So I'll say auto configure stub runner. And the ID, I'm going to point it to the Maven uh, local repository. Okay. I could do class path, I could do a, a remote artifactory, but I'm going to point it to the local one, and I'm going to tell it what to find. I'm going to say, I've just installed a Maven artifact. I want the latest version of it, and I want to run the resulting stubs uh, on port 8080. So I'm saying, go to, you know, based on this, go to the Maven repository, whether it's on your local class path, whether it's in your local M2, or in some organizational thing. And then based on that, use our group, uh, sorry, group ID, artifact ID, the latest version, and then this, and run it on that port. Okay, and now with that, I should be able to run it and see the same test work. Or not, or not, could also just break. So what did we do? What's wrong? Oh, look at that. Reservation name is null. We caught the bug, right? We've caught the bug. So now, how do we fix that? I think we can, I think we're all pretty home free at this point, right? So go here, just change that to name. Just name like this. My, my predicate will break. That's fine. Rerun. Good stuff, huh? All right, my friends. So there we go. We've now looked at uh, testing from zero to, to production. We've started from the smallest to the small and worked our way up to the microservices boundaries. Obviously, we've just begun to scratch the surface here. The real opportunity is in Spring Cloud Contract for larger systems. Obviously, this trivial you know, producer-consumer example is just the very humblest of beginnings. Uh, Spring Cloud Contract has a lot of different ways to work. You can actually have a shared artifact repository that both producer and consumer deploy to. So it's not just in the producer. Right? Uh, for example, I could have the, the, the contracts living in a sort of a, a triangle formation. We have shared artifacts for the, for the contracts, and then producer and consumer that depend on that. 
Um, you can also use other kinds of interactions. So here, I've been using HTTP. Is that the only way to build microservices in 2019? Of course not, right? H people are talking about messaging. So Spring Cloud Contract can do the same thing. People say, oh, well, you're, clearly the problem you faced here was because you're using HTTP. But as soon as you've got a producer and a consumer that, de that depend on a consistent message, then you've got that same problem. You've got the possible possibility for conflicts. This, this is not any less true when you're doing messaging with Kafka or RabbitMQ or whatever. So we have support for messaging there as well. Another opportunity is if you're using Spring Cloud Contract and Spring REST docs. Spring REST docs can be used to generate the documentation as you're writing the tests, right? Remember the Agile Manifesto says uh, comprehensive, uh, sorry, working software over comprehensive documentation. But if you can get both, why not, right? And so in this case, you're writing the test manually. So you can also generate the, the, the contract from the test as opposed to generating the test from the contract. And then you, and the rest, of the rest is the same. You, you deploy the contract and share that. So you have a lot of opportunities here, my friends. I want to thank you so much for hanging out. Did you learn something new? I'm just curious. Did anybody learn anything new? Oh, very good. That makes me feel better. I never know with this crowd. You're all so, so uh, cutting edge here in, in the UK. Thank you so much, my friends. Have a great day.